right. Well, it is a great day to be together with you guys. My name is Mike. I get to serve here as uh, the lead pastor at Harvest. And as Joel just mentioned in the trailer was talking about, um, in a few weeks, we'll be entering that series. I think we gave you some invites on the way in. Did we do that? Somebody wave some. If you got it, wave it. All right. So the idea is that's not just information for you. But that's a great tool for you to use to invite somebody. If, if you remember back, if you've been tracking with us for a while in this blessed series that we did just a bit ago and wrapped up, uh, there are people that I imagine that you're praying for. And, and maybe even on that list, there's some people that you've prayed for, you've had some conversations around church before. Um, what I love about a series like this one is it gives you a different opportunity. Maybe like, I, I already tried to bring them before and they weren't interested. This is a little bit different. And so maybe, you know, with your wisdom, pray about that. The people on your list. Is this a series that you're like, this is worth circling back with that neighbor on? Or they've got kids that I think would think this is fun. Maybe take advantage of that and invite somebody, bring somebody with you. Um, as Joel mentioned, the idea every week, every series, uh, each time that we do something together, I'm far away from that. Um, we are always focused on God's word. And uh, I, I love movies. I love stories. So over the um, expected gap in time, we had a hurricane came through. You probably noticed that, right? It was kind of a big deal in preparation. Hopefully for you, not a big deal in, in what actually happened, right? But, uh, but we ended up with some extra days. And so there's this movie series that, uh, that I loved, the book series. I loved The Lord of the Rings. And um, one or two of like our older kids had seen the movie trilogy, but we made it through all like almost nine hours. <laughs> of the three movies, right? Each one was almost three hours in length. But I, I love a great story, and I love more than any great story, the gospel story. And what's amazing is how even outside of a, a, a knowledge of God, a personal relationship with God, the stories that come out scratch at how he's wired us and created us. And there's this longing for restoration that comes through in, in a great story that even in the best restored version of that story, it still falls short of the beauty of what God's doing, but it hints in powerful ways. So I think that uh, this is a great opportunity for you to bring somebody um, as well. But we are in a series that's called Bar Talk, Building Adult Relationships. Last week, um, we kicked off and talked about kind of three levels of friendship. Um, this week, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, and that's work. All right, and look at somebody next to you and say, I'm excited. <laughs> and if you said that sarcastically, it's okay. Um, I, I am excited about this, um, this topic in particular. What we're going to do, while well, last week we looked at the friendships and different levels of friendship that you build, those play in. If you work, you have a job that you work outside of the home in some way, you crisscross with people, the work that you do may be volunteering in the community. You can apply everything we said last week to those relationships this week. But one thing that I realize is absolutely, I think we struggle to grasp is really the underlying purpose of work. Like what does God have to say through his word about work? And so before we get to God's word, let's just maybe define how we use the word today. You can see that with me over here. This is Miriam Webster's online, all right? Work is one way to define it, an activity in which one exerts strength or faculties to do or perform something. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? You might think of work as the opposite of rest and leisure, right? So at one end, we, there's just play and, and leisure and rest. And the other side, we're, we're accomplishing something. We're, we're working. Um, a, another way to, that this is defined, you may use it this way when you think of work as like the job that you do. Work could be an activity a person engages in regularly to earn a livelihood. So in other words, you think of the work that you do, like the J-O-B, the job that you perform, that maybe you get paid to do. Does God have anything to say about either of those lanes of work? And the reality is, there is so much that he does. Like, we're going to barely scratch at the surface of this today. I hope that you'll leave with something that you realize that God is actually super involved and wants to be in your day-to-day -day job. If, when you think of work, you think of something that you spend a lot of your waking hours throughout the week doing, here's the really good news. God cares about that, like all of that. And he has purposes for the time that you spend so much time in this lane. God actually has plans and designs and purposes for how he wants to use that in your life and, and in powerful ways. So what does he say about 
about work. And I have to, I have to confess and, and apologize for something that people like me, like pastors, I think sometimes we're so excited about part of the work that God calls us to do that we don't do a good job of talking about all of the rest of the work. Here's what I mean by that. Um, we are excited about and should be sharing the gospel and the importance of that, right? The, the, uh, we refer to something as the great commission, Jesus' commandment to all of his disciples to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything he's commanded us. That's the basis for our mission statement as a church. The way we word it is that we're people helping people know and follow Jesus. That is our mission. That is critical for us. That is an important, maybe the most important call and the thing we get to do, but, but it's not the only thing that God calls us to. And in fact, when we think of going and making disciples, teaching people to know and to follow Jesus, right, to obey everything he's commanded us to do, Think about that for a minute. We're taught to obey everything he's commanded us to do. One of the things he's taught us to do is to evangelize. That's part of that. But our discipleship, becoming like Jesus, involves all of our life, all of our relationships. And it involves what he calls you to do vocationally, through work, through your job, through what you do at home. So your work and God's call in your life isn't just about sharing Jesus with people. But he really cares about the other 99% of probably how you spend your time, even in your workplace. And, and there's this challenge uh, there's a, that, uh, of how I think sometimes we've described within the church your call in work where we still bounce right back to evangelism. And the, there's this author that um, I found helpful in this thinking of, of work and God's call in our life. If you want to jot down a name, I don't think we included this in your notes, um, but his name is Jordan Rayner, and that's where I get kind of this description from. Um, he has a book, uh, The Sacredness of Secular Work. And I thought this idea was really helpful personally. Maybe it is for you. But we can talk about value through two different ways, instrumental value and intrinsic value. The idea of instrumental value is that your, if you think of it in the context of your work and how maybe the church, like a lot of times we talk about things, is we talk about the value of your work in that it accomplishes a different thing. Or more specifically, like there's value in your work because in those places you get to share Jesus, right? You get to evangelize there. That would be a, an example of an instrumental value. It's not saying the work in and of itself matters, but it gives you an opportunity to do this other thing, and that other thing matters. And it does, but does God give an intrinsic value to your work? J just the thing that you get to do, the, whether that's a, a J-O-B that you're paid for, or that's what you do, whether that's serving meals at home, mowing the lawn, whether that's creating spreadsheets at work and working in a cubicle or training new employees or thinking about this entrepreneurial adventure, all of those things, is there intrinsic value in those? In other words, does the thing in and of itself matter to God? What you spend most of your time doing, and here's the good news, it does. Here, there's so much God says through his word. We're going to look at just a little bit uh, and move somewhat quickly. If you uh, want to take some notes, I'm going to give you the cheat sheet, all right? Uh, on that seatback card in front of you, you could scan the little QR code. That'll open our program, and you're going to see the content that we'll share here with you as well. But let's jump into God's word. We're going to spend a bit of time in the book of Genesis, this very first book of the Bible, and look at how God created things in the beginning. So if we look at the very beginning of God's Creation, when he gets through these six days of creation, on the sixth day, he gets to this description of his purposes behind you and me for humanity and what he's doing. Read this with me on the screen. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Now catch this when you think about your work. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it and have dominion, he says, over the fish of the seas. And he goes on to describe over uh, everything that he has just made. He now tells man 
to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. There's such meaning and power behind those words. If you think about it for just a minute, um, be fruitful and multiply has this idea of, well, what it just sounds like. In the other days of creation, God has created things like plants, and he says plants are going to bear other plants like the seed. And so you're gonna, they're going to propagate, and they're going to fill the earth, right? And so he's designed this fruitfulness through creation. Animals, likewise, they're going to breed more animals like themselves and, and fill the earth. And then he says to man that he's created, you're going to be fruitful and multiply. Your fruitfulness and multiplication is kind of the same and a little bit different. Uh, you require a little bit more intentionality in filling the earth and multiplying. If you think about the difference of a plant that grows versus hu more humans being born, uh, you realize you've got to do a little bit more work deliberately to make that happen. But God gives you the charge to actually be fruitful and to multiply. That includes how we birth more people. That's part of how we fill the earth, but also has this idea of this, this spreading from man placed in this location in the garden where God started a process that he actually expects us to continue, to be fruitful, to multiply. He says to subdue it. Um, the idea of the word subdue includes, think about this, even when the earth was perfect, we're going to get to sin in a moment, but before that, even when it was perfect, even we'll see in a moment when God says he paused from his work because he'd finished his work. There's this built-in expectation that the people he placed are going to continue the work that he started. They actually have a job to do. God has set things up, and now he's going to work not as directly, but more through people in this way. They are to subdue the earth, to, to continue to cultivate it like a garden. There's this, I want to grab this box. Give me a minute here. There's this uh, fun thing that my wife discovered for our youngest uh, daughter, Addie, at the house. It was, um, I mean, a brilliant YouTube strategy. So there's a guy, Mark Rober, you may have heard of. He has quite a following on YouTube. And then he had the brilliant strategy to have a physical product launch. So he's this science engineer type. He had all these fun engineering videos. My favorite, there's this one of this squirrel trap setup thing he built in his backyard. And that's worth a watch. Somebody's clapping. You love that one, right? It's amazing. If you don't know, you're missing out. Okay. So, but then he had the brilliant idea, let me sell things, not just YouTube advertisements. And so we got hooked on this. These are called Crunch Labs. So in each box, you can subscribe to these or order them one off, but you get a box that the engineer has designed an activity to fulfill. I love how it's described here on the side. Uh, build, test, solve, and play. So Mark Rober, or whoever does this for him, has these kits that you get to unpack and you get to then build the thing. You get to... You know, somebody has designed the thing, but you get to then put it together. You get to take the principle of the thing, the, the potential of the thing that the designer created, and you get to fulfill its potential by putting it together and then like, building it, using your intellect that way, and, and playing with it, which is pretty fun. If we could grasp a little bit, it's not a perfect example, but think about how God created the world, and it's a lot like this. He actually loves you enough that God has created this world and gifted you with intellect, with ability and facilities to go do amazing work. His purposes were always planned to be fulfilled through people. And so that, if you think about Adam and Eve and in the garden, there was great work for them to do before there was ever a need to evangelize, right? As important for us as that is, the work that they got to do were things a lot like what you do, T taking resources and, and making them more fruitful. You know, we live in a, in a day and age where maybe for most of your work or many of your work, you, you don't have this tangible product that you deliver. Some of you do. But you have other intangible goods that you still get to build and enrich somebody's life. You're the baker who bakes something. The entrepreneur who, who thinks of a creative way to make some aspect of life a little bit more meaningful or easier or better. Like we get to, well, we get to build and test and, and solve and play. Or in other words, we get to fill the earth, to subdue it, 
and to have dominion over it, like to, to rule in God's place. That idea of dominion has this idea of being a steward, like God is ultimately in charge and control, but he has asked you under his leadership to do good in the world, to take his plans and expand them and fulfill them. I think work matters in so many ways. Um, you're going to see a few of these in our, just our time together, but your work matters. So think of intrinsic value, right? The thing that you get to spend time on, it matters to God. In fact, because work is what God created people to do. In the very beginning, he gave people work to do. You know, in Genesis 2, we have this real up-close personal view. We go from the overview of creation in Genesis 1 to this really, man, it's a beautifully intimate picture of God who gets involved working with the materials that he's just created to make Adam and form him out of the dust. And then he does this. Look at Genesis 2.15. It says, the Lord God took the man, the one that he had just lovingly formed, breathed life into, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work. To work it and to keep it. Now, if when you think about work, it, it causes a sense of like a downer, a, a stress, we're going to get to maybe why that is, but I want you to hold that tension. Why is it at times we feel like work is, well, work is punishment or work is, and work must be not God's plan? What we actually see is, well, work was God's design for us in the beginning. It's good. He made us to do it. In fact, work is, work is a gift. The, the gift that God gives is not a vacation. The, the greater gift God gives is a vocation, right? An ability to do good work on his behalf. Look at what he continues to say. God himself, well, he worked, right? As you look at Genesis and the teaching of God and his work that he had done, it's repeated again and again in the work that he had done. And then it wraps up after six days of creation. God gives this picture of a Sabbath, a seventh day of rest. It says God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy, set aside, purposefully different. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. I mean, think about the fact that does your work, does work in and of itself matter? Absolutely. Another reason is, according to God's word, God himself worked. How could something that God do, does, right, not matter and be worthwhile and important? God himself worked. This is a totally unexpected idea. If you're outside of that Judeo-Christian faith, outside of the scriptures, other just world views and world religions don't have the same view of a, of a God who would work just for the joy of it, just because he wanted to. You know, in ancient like uh, Greek mythology, that religious worldview, there was this idea of this first you know, iteration of the gods in, in man. And, and in that setting for the Greeks, the gods and humans in the legends of that first age of mankind, they didn't have to work. Work was an unfortunate result in that worldview that came later. Like it wasn't the perfect thing. But God actually works just for the, for the joy of it. And he continues to work in our world. You know, Jesus himself talks about the work that he was doing and he refers to his father, to God, and says, God, my father is always at his work to this very day. And I too am working. You know, God continues to be involved in your day-to-day -day life. And so why is it though that for many of you, I can fall victim to this too. When we think of work, we have a, a negative view of work, right? That it causes us a, a, a sense of a feeling that it's just, there's something wrong about it. And for some of you, you're like, I know the problem. It's my boss, right? My boss just ruins work for me. You have an answer, but maybe from a more big picture perspective, and this is where I get to be nerdy. We're going to draw this. You, you saw, if you tracked with us in this BLESS series, this tool that we call the three circles. And in that, we talked about God's design, the beginning of creation. We've just been talking about that in our time, but that we live in a world that we don't seem to experience this goodness and blessing the way that it just seems purposeful. Like when we think about work, why does work feel like a downer instead of like a gift? And the reality is we said we live in a world with brokenness. And in the brokenness of our world, how do we get there, right? Well, we're going to see that path in the scriptures. You know, quickly on the other side of 
the description that we have of God who created this great work for us to do, we realize if you turn the page for your Bibles, you scroll up on your phone app, just one chapter, you go from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3, and you have man and, and woman who sin. They eat from a tree they were told not to do. They, instead of following God's design, they follow their own path, and that path to sin led to, to brokenness in their lives. And so we have what we refer to as, as the fall in the Christian faith, this idea of, of the fall. We read in Genesis 3.17, where God on the other side of the sin of, of Adam and of Eve, actually in Genesis 3, 16, he says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing and your pain in pain you shall bring forth children, be fruitful and, and multiply. We, we see this un, not an undoing of God's design, but now a pain connected to God's design because of sin. So be fruitful and multiply. Suddenly that's gonna be more painful than it was designed to be, he says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. He says, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Work of the ground suddenly becomes broken, right? It doesn't work originally to God's design because of, of sin. He goes on to say, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, and for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So all of the good of God's design in the beginning gets wrecked. It's, it's broken because of the sin in our world. That includes then this call, this, this vocation, this, this great gift of work that we have, that the, the fall, to put it differently, um, the fall neither made work, right? God created work. Um, nor ended work, like there wasn't a sense of now we don't work anymore, but what it did, right, it frustrated work. There's this sense of the brokenness of our world in our sin that we have, we've frustrated the work of God's design, and what was a gift becomes a burden. What was a gift becomes something that causes us anxiety. What was a great gift from God sometimes becomes more important to us than God, and it becomes our God where we, we, form our identity around our work, so much of the good gift that God has is, is broken because of the sin in our world. So what is God's solution for that? We read in places like this about the, the work that Jesus does to redeem all of the good things that God created in the beginning. Uh, can I tell you something? God's pretty smart. You, you convinced of that? I mean, pretty smart is definitely an understatement. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. Um, he knows everything, right? He purposed everything. God wasn't surprised when Adam and Eve fell. It's not like it took him off guard and he had to sit around and decide, now what do I do? I did not see that coming. Like, that's not the God that the scriptures portray. God has a plan that included knowing everything that was going to happen and his solution from the get-go. Jesus in his, his death and his resurrection and what we refer to as the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did, God had a plan of redeeming not just some things, not just our hearts and our souls, but all of the good work of what he did. We read this in Colossians in the New Testament, talking about Jesus. It says, in him, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So in Jesus, God himself has come in the flesh. And through him, through Jesus, Look at this purpose. His purpose is to reconcile to himself, not some things, not just our soul, to reconcile, to make right again all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. God has begun a work, if we go back to this, that is bigger than just our work, but it includes our work, right? We have the story of Jesus, we refer to as the gospel, which literally means good news. The good news, that verse we just read, that through Jesus, God is restoring, he's making right again, he's reconciling all things through his death on the cross, through his resurrection. And so the things that still feel kind of messed up and frustrated by sin, well, God's not done with yet. We have a part to play in the good news of what God's doing, to, to receive it, to accept it. There's this uh, idea for us where we need to repent and believe. Do we trust Jesus 
to do the work that he said to do. Does that inform how we even view our work? Do we turn from work being either our idol or work being our frustration and, and allow God's word to inform us and say, man, what would it look like? for the work that I get to do to be a gift that God gives me to use and to do good in our world. And we get this pathway back to God's design that we can recover what he designed things for when God says he's reconciling all things through Jesus. That can mean what it feels like to you to create a spreadsheet in your workplace what it feels like to make meals and plan ahead at home or to to get up and mow the yard on a weekend? What if all of these things for us, we could understand that, man, in big ways and small ways, we get to worship through the work that we do, a designer who is amazing. And that, that work is a gift that we can now recover and pursue God's design in our lives. Again, your work matters in so many Ways. Your work matters, as we've been talking about, because Jesus redeems work, making it sacred again. What feels like a frustration, Jesus can make a gift of worship and purpose again. He's reconciling. He's redeeming all things. We read in Ephesians a similar idea that God, while he saves us through faith and not a work that we do to God, he saves us so that we can recover and pursue good works. It says we're created where we are his, what is the word? Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we, that we should walk in them. Your work, it matters. Intrinsically, your work matters. In fact, it's part of the purpose that you were saved for. God didn't just save you so that someday you could go to heaven. He saved you in that today, like this week, There are things that he wants to do through you in your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood. God has created a work that he's he's made sacred again in a way in our lives. I love, um, there's a Christian author, Oz Guinness, and he wrote a book called The Call. And he describes this idea of a primary call in our life and and secondary callings in our life. And if the primary call is our, our need to get right with God again through the gospel, that God also calls us, though, in secondary ways in how we parent and how we work and that he cares intimately about all of those callings in our life. I want to give you a a definition of what maybe work, a redeemed work, a, a sacred work could look like. What is the purpose of what God wants you to do not just when you're evangelizing, but in the, the other 99% of the time that you may spend working? And it's this. Sacred work is what's well, worship. It's a worshipful use of our God-given abilities to impact our world. And we're fulfilling God's creation mandate with eternity and his glory in mind. We're fulfilling God's creation mandate. What is that? Well, if you go back to what we said, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue and to rule it. In the beginning, God at creation had a commission, a mandate for people to expand the good that he started And to to multiply that through the earth. So what is the the work that we get to do? Not just for our glory, though, but for God's glory. And with a sense of eternity in mind. This is hard for me. Maybe it's hard for you. But on a day-to-day basis, it's it's hard for me to wake up thinking that there's purposes in what I'm going to do in just the hours ahead of my work day. That actually have eternal implications to it. And maybe it's easier to think of like the ways of like, okay, when I share the gospel with someone, that, okay, I get that has eternal implications. But can I say also, but when you get up and you just parent your child well, when you, when you take time to, to use the gifts that God has given you, and you, you put the intelligence and the creativity to become not just a, a mediocre manager, but to become a leader that people love showing up to work for and that they feel enriched by and they feel like they can, they're better people. And because of like your role as a leader in their life, you, you're doing a work that, that God for eternity keeps in mind. You have a God who forgets none of the good work that you do. He's designed it for you. You know, as a parent, there are times where I get to see kind of a glimpse of something like one of our kids does or that, that they, you just see this progression of their, 
their, um, their growth and their development in a cool way, and, and we celebrate that. Do you believe that, that God like, looks at the work that you do and, and he's proud of you? But there are times where he just thinks, man, that was an amazing use of the gift that I put in you for the fruitfulness of what you did. God, God celebrates the work that he accomplishes through you, and it's ultimately all for his glory. So here's what I want to close with. Real practical. Four tips. Okay, if all of this is true, if God has intrinsic value on your work, what are just maybe four work tips that you could take away and, and have a mindset to embrace this purpose? The first is this. It sounds simple. If you can work, you should. Okay, God actually in the scriptures, like he gives this sense that like you're called to work and, and if we can work, we should. Uh, in the New Testament, in Second Thessalonians, he actually says for even when um, we were with you, Paul, the writer of this, is saying, when we were with you, uh, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, then let him not eat. That sounds pretty rude. But for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Um, the, the New Testament gives us this picture that we're supposed to be productive in, in work. Now, I get for, for some of you, that's not like a working income um, isn't something that you were able to do right now. Or you may be struggling to find work. If we can work, we should work. And when we work, well, we should work not like our, I don't care who your boss is, if you understand this, that you work like Jesus is is your boss. At the end of the day, we're accountable to him and not to man. Um, We're told that whether we eat or drink or whatever you do, to do it all for the glory of of God. So whether you're making a peanut butter sandwich for your kids to take to school or you're emailing from your cubicle or you're scrubbing toilets, we can do all of that for the glory of God. We work like Jesus is our boss. We take this picture of what God is doing to reconcile all things, to gain glory for himself, and, and we let all of that inform how we do what we're called to do. We let our faith shape our view of the work that we do. This means so much more than just not doing the wrong thing, but how, how do you, as someone in a, in a place of, of work or in relationships with others, how do you do that in such a way that others look at you and you have a credibility that they're paying attention to? Because of the joy that you bring, because of the capacity that you bring to the work that you do, do others look at you and you've created a sense of trust, of credibility, that they're curious what motivates you or what drives you that you create opportunities that you can share your faith because people are asking you about why you just work differently than others do. There's this important principle, fourthly, that in all the work that we do, the productivity that God asks us to, to do, that we're not created just to work and to be slaves of work, but we're actually told and commanded to take time to rest. In the very beginning, when God worked, he rested on the seventh day. And we read that, right? And that gave us a template of rest, of Sabbath, a breaking from the work that we do. If you don't, if you don't keep a rhythm of, of rest from the work that you do, then you become a slave to the work that you do. Instead of work becoming a gift, work becomes a slave master over you. And some of you, you're in that lane and you, you got to figure this out. What is a way that in the rhythms of your week, you can, you can rest and allow God to rejuvenate you and to fill you again, to motivate you, to, to allow you to work from a place of, of rest and not from a place of, of weariness. God has given so much to help us to understand the goodness of his design and the purpose of, of his work. And as we close, what I want to do is I want to take some time and celebrate communion together. And when we think about what we get to celebrate with communion and this idea of rest, we have a celebration of Jesus who God in the flesh came for leaving heaven behind. He came to do a work that none of us could do, that all of us, all of us are actually slaves. The Bible would say we're slaves to sin. That sin isn't just a brokenness that's external, but it's a brokenness that's internal. And we don't have a way to fix it on our own. We don't have a way to to get back to what God's design is on our own. We need a savior. And and so in Jesus, in his death on the cross, he pays the penalty for my sin and for your sin. In his resurrection, again, from the dead, he proves that he is who he said that he was. 
that he is the son of God, that he has power to do what he said he could do, which is to forgive our sins. And that in him and his resurrection from the dead, we're told he, he sends us the Holy Spirit to give new life within, to allow us to work, not just from our power, but through his power in our lives. We celebrate in communion that through the death of Jesus, we have an opportunity to have all things redeemed, made right again, inwardly and through God's work in us. And so we're gonna take time and we're gonna use that song we introduced a moment ago. What I want you to do as the band begins and sings the song is to, um, if you're on kind of this half of the room, to come up here and take the communion elements, a cup and a, a cracker and take that back with you to your seat. Just hang on to them. We have another table set up on this side for this half of the room. We're gonna hang on to those elements. At the end of this song, we're gonna take those together. And I wanna encourage you, will you just, will you pay attention to the words of this song as we sing about Christ being magnified? There may be some work you just need to do between you and God to, to in your own heart, maybe confess some things, to admit some things that you've, you've done wrong and stepped out of his design and you need him to help restore and to redeem in your own heart. And if you're, you're new here to Harvest, um, the way we celebrate communion is you're welcome to participate as long as you feel comfortable doing so. I would ask you this, if at some point in your journey, you've made a confession of faith in Jesus as Lord, if you're um, a follower of Jesus, that you define yourself that as a, as a Christian, celebrate with us, whether this is your first time or you're new here. At the same time, I, uh, one of the things I love about this church, there's always some of you, you're just on a journey. You're, you're still thinking through the faith. And you're wrestling with the truth of that. And this may not be something that you'd say, it makes sense to me to do yet. That's absolutely fine. We love it that you're here. So I just encourage you, take time. And will you do something kind of courageous though? And will you just pray the words of the song that we're about to sing? If they don't make sense to you, just pray a simple prayer. God, if you're who we're singing about up here, will you make that make sense to me? Again, we're gonna take these elements and we'll celebrate together in just a moment.